Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I am your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. Today, I have a wonderful guest. His name is Alan Ernst, and he is the regional director of Safari Club International, also known as SCI. He is a Washington boy, and I wanted to talk with him about all things SCI related, but also specifically about the right to hunt. And we're going to talk about that. And it's something that that us outdoorsmen were all about. We were always like, it's it's our right to hunt, or it's our right to fish, it's our right to be out on public land and all this, but is it really our right? And is there any legislation to back it up? So we're going to be talking about that today, but thank you so much for joining us, Alan. How you doing, man? Great, Johnny. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure, man. It's a long time coming for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I apologize. It's uh been a bit of a firestorm <laughs> in my line of work. So yeah, tell the listeners what is it that you do in your day job? Oh yeah, I am a financial planner and investment manager. I own my own uh, firm and uh, primarily work with uh, conservative-minded folks that uh, like to hunt and fish. So I love it. Yeah, the yeah. financial aspect is really interesting in these <laughs> days right now of. Uh, stock market and people not working and losing their jobs and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It's been uh, difficult for lots of folks out there. I imagine. So. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that it's keeping you on your toes. So Alan, give the listeners a little bit of background on yourself, how you got into hunting and then how you got connected with working for SCI. Sure. Um, <clears throat> our family has, uh, Gosh, I think a eighth or ninth generation uh, cattle ranch in South Central Oregon. Uh, one of my great, 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 whatever grandmothers was one of the first women to come across on the Oregon Trail, and they settled uh, settled in the Summer Lake Valley. and And uh, I I grew up spending all of my spare time uh, being an indentured servant <laughs> on the ranch, and. Uh, uh, Usually after what we call dinner, which is the, the meal of the middle of the day, uh, my grandfather would go take a nap and hand me a box of 22 shells and off I'd go with a single shot Winchester to, to uh, whack some jackrabbits or, or you know, whatever came across my, my path. But uh, that's, that's how I got started hunting. And there was, in retrospect, it was, it's kind of amazing to give a six-year-old kid a, a a rifle <laughs> film to go terrorize the, the countryside but um yeah so that's that's how i got my start and uh my my dad worked for the forest service he wasn't really um the hunting wasn't really his thing uh then i got into college and uh you know broke ass college student could, really couldn't afford to, to go out and hunt or, or fish or do much of that so it was only after I uh, graduated and uh, had a little bit of disposable income and, um, and an uncle who was a mentor to me that took me under his wing and, and uh, gosh, we went out mule deer hunting a lot and elk hunting and I just, I, I was hooked. So uh, now I spend about anywhere from 40 to 65 days of the year uh, hunting. So. I work my butt off during the uh, the winter and spring and, and summer so I can take some time off in the fall to go do those things that I love to do. Man, that sounds awesome. And I was listening to you on the, uh, I think it was the Kafaru cast with Aaron Snyder. He talks about how your love is the uh, high high buck hunt here in the state of Washington. Yeah, don't tell anybody, but it's, it's the best hunt ever. <laughs> <laughs> he says you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you don't have to draw. For it um you do have to work your ass off for it um uh, and speaking of which i probably should start hitting the the tread climber a lot harder but uh because that's just around the corner geez yeah it's but coming up I, very quick i love it it's uh, uh i somehow managed to get roped up with some uh, other 
like-minded guys that for whatever reason call us crazy love to throw a backpack on and uh trudge about 22 miles back to the spot that we try to get to every year and um uh, you know sometimes there's just not one that we you know feel like taking but for me it's it's uh we can have two weeks of just awesome vacation I, I get to get out there and just press the reset button and uh you know think about a lot of things that that uh you don't necessarily have time to focus on during these you know crazy busy times of uh, two trading monitors in front of me and the phone call always you know the phone's always ringing so yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh it's a way to escape and connect with nature and your creator and just focus on what you love and, and really get in tune with yourself. So I, I hear you on that. The back country is where I found myself as well. So tell us a little bit about how you got connected with SCI and your role within SCI. Sure. Uh, well, uh, a buddy and I had uh, somehow or another seen an announcement for one of the SCI uh, banquets that used to happen at the Bell, at the Maidenbauer Center in Bellevue. And I think at the time they did that in conjunction with the NRA and the Wild Chief Foundation. But um, it, was, it was a huge deal. There was, it was almost like a mini sportsman show. And um, anyway, we went and uh, it was a massive eye opener for me. I, I, had, I was used to going to other organization events like uh, Ducks Unlimited and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And they're, they're fantastic organizations. But this one, there was, there was just something about it that lit uh, a fire under me. And I, I immediately picked up the phone Monday morning and began to, uh, to call around to figure out where their next board meeting was and, and uh, you know, if I could come and that sort of thing. So that, uh, <clears throat> that started a chain of events where I probably raised my hand way too many times to volunteer for stuff and... Uh, Got involved with the board, and then I was the vice president and the president, and uh, now I'm the regional representative for the organization. We've got uh, six chapters in the state, and uh, it's sure keeps me busy during the legislative session and the fundraising. Yeah, I, I would imagine. I would imagine. That's part of what we're going to be talking about today is, is uh, legislation for hunting and fishing and all that. So... Safari Club International, being a, a newer hunter, you know, you hear safari and you automatically think Africa, but really Safari Club International, safari is just another term for adventure. So you could really like redefine it like Adventure Club International. Their main thing is that they are first for defending hunting rights. Correct? I, am I misspoken on that? You, you are right, sir. So Safari Club International is the leader in protecting the freedom to hunt and in promoting wildlife conservation worldwide. We are a 501c4 nonprofit organization of hunters that operate through our network of 200 chapters, which in my estimation are the backbone of the organization. We've got approximately 50,000 members that are uh, passionate about hunting and wildlife conservation. And our, our two primary missions are to protect the, the freedom to hunt and promote wildlife conservation. If you, uh, <clears throat> one way to think about it is that we're the NRA of hunting, right? Mm. Uh, and I like to say that you should join the NRA to protect your gun rights. You should join SCI to protect your hunting rights. And then join all of the species-specific conservation organizations that you are interested in, whether that's the Elk Foundation or Ducks Unlimited or the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance or Wild Sheep Foundation. You know, whatever turns your crank there. But it's it's that order, in my estimation, of how people should join these organizations. And unfortunately, it's usually the other way around. And then people don't understand. Um, you know, I, I get people that are friends of mine that are in the elk foundation and are like well why do i need to belong to the sci i already belong to uh xyz organization and i'm like well you know thank you for joining those absolutely and i belong to them as well but those are those are primarily habitat organizations they don't really have, have anything to do with um you know the types of things that we 
or SCI does at the local, state, and national level. You know, for example, the SCI is headquartered in Washington, D.C., and one of the major aspects that sets us apart from the other sportsmen's organizations is that we have an office building that is literally right across the street from the Hart Senate office building, and it is staffed with experienced law and policy analysts and litigators and uh, government relation experts that uh, help evaluate and lobby on federal, state, local, and international legislation that impacts hunting and hunters and wildlife conservation. So um, there's a, we're, we're probably the, the biggest 800 pound gorilla that most hunters haven't really heard about um, or, or thought about it in that way. Cause they just, they see the word safari and they, their eyes gloss over and they just think of uh, elephant hunting or lion hunting in Africa. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So, yeah, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to have you guys on this episode is to talk about the the barriers in people's minds that keep them from even want to engage with SCI and, and you know, thinking of it as like an old white-haired, white male men's club uh, with rich dudes that can travel and pay for these extravagant hunts. Really, SCI is the only organization that is funding actual lawyers that go to bat in every state or in the nation's capital for hunters rights. And, and that's what is really different. Like you look at all these other conservation groups, it's like a $30 a year annual membership to be a member of SCI is actually $65. And I don't even think you get like a hat or anything like that. It, that money is just going into more or less the defense fund. Is that a good way to put it? That's a pretty good way to put it. Uh, I mean, we have, like the other organizations, there's, uh, uh, I think, six six magazines that they put out a year. Uh, there's a monthly newspaper-type publication. You also get uh, an e-newsletter, I believe, weekly that goes out. Um, you are also able to get involved in the hunter advocacy uh, organization or, or aspect of the organization. Um, so there's that. And then that also allows you to join the the local chapter, which and I alluded to this before, is is really the backbone of the organization. Um, I've got six chapters in the state, uh, and they raise a ton of money for uh, wildlife conservation and education, humanitarian efforts, you name it. I mean, just alone, the Seattle Puget Sound chapter has put, I think, two and a half million dollars back into it. That's just one chapter. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So I recently had Brian Lynn from the Sportsman's Alliance on to talk about the Sportsman's Alliance and what they do. And I really enjoyed that conversation. But one of the things the Sportsman's Alliance doesn't do is they don't have lawyers that will go and, and battle. Um, what you guys do is a part of that. And it's really interesting to see, like in the hunting world, we're so often on the defense we're having to defend what we love we're having to defend our second amendment rights uh our public land the animals in which we want to pursue and the the balance between predator and prey and all that along with public perception and and uh ignorance really when it comes down to hunting and i feel like sci it they're a group that you can really call upon to, to take some action. They're not just going to sit back and kind of see how things play out before they, they dive in. Is that kind of how you've uh, really felt about, about your organization? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and that's primarily what I, what I appreciate about, appreciate about it uh, so much other than the, the friendships and everything that I've, I've got over the years. It's, it's knowing that, this 800 pound gorilla exists out there that has a team of highly dedicated, unbelievably intelligent litigators that are not bashful at all about going head to head with the likes of PETA and the Humane Society and all of these other anti-hunting organizations that are out there. Um, and it's, uh, unfortunately, we are oftentimes, or, or most of the time, the, the only you know, sportsman's group at the table. And, uh, but we're, we're happy to take that fight on. So. 
I love it. Well, let's talk about the right to hunt. And so one of the things that I've really, well, I'm passionate about, and I actually want to start some movement within the state of Washington, is getting the state of Washington to write into the state constitution that it is a right to fish and to hunt. Now, 19, let's see here. I got to look at my notes. 1977, Vermont was the very first state that allowed hunting and fishing to be written into their state constitution. That The second one was 1996. And since then, 22 states have the right to hunt and fish in state legislation and the constitution. Only two of them, California being one of them, has the right to fish, but not hunt. And so ironically... There's a lot of these Western states that it's not written into the Constitution. What is your take on that? And, and being on the forefront, you know, we we as hunters are constantly defending ourselves. But how about the advocacy of, you know, so much is talked about the anti-hunter. But really what we need to do is get the 80% of non-hunters to then want to support why hunting is important. And what's your take on that? Well, I, I would love to have the constitutional right to hunt and fish in this state. Um, unfortunately, I think that it would be, well, it's, it's impossible right now in this particular environment with uh, the Democrats uh, having control of the uh, House, Senate, and, and obviously the, uh, the governor's uh, position. So that, that would be highly problematic to do. Um, the other, the alternative is we could, we could go after uh, an initiative and get the 360,000 signatures that, that, uh, we would require. And I think if, if we were able to do that, uh, normally, you know, and we'd have uh, great big sportsman shows that people can go to with, uh, you know, not, not having this, uh, house to house lockdown, uh, that, that would make getting those signatures easier. Um, and I, I think getting that written, the, here's the deal when it comes to writing initiatives, you need to have both the, the, the verbiage that goes on the ballot, correct. And so that your, your 80%, uh, just non-hunting population will look at that and think that it's reasonable and rational. Most people don't bother to pick up the voters pamphlet. So, um, I, I would love to work with anybody out there that is willing to uh, put forth a ton of effort to, to get something like that moving, because uh, I, I really think that that's the only way we're going to get that through uh, in this state. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I feel like in the state of Washington, if the 80% non-hunter public saw fishing and hunting, fishing and hunting being a right in the state, they'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. This uh, state of Washington is really known for salmon fishing. Of course we want that written into our state constitution. And I think it's a great way to slip that in and uh, and get the non-hunter to vote for it without you know, the people that pick up the pamphlet and necessarily read the wordage and all that. So I also am blown away at like, you know, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so where does just the ability to procure your own food fall under life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness? You know, I don't want to be fed government food the rest of my life. I want to be able to have the choice and the freedom to be able to go and provide for my own family the way I want to provide for my family. And I think that's one of the things that people are missing is that they think you know, the store is freedom. Going to the store is is the freedom to procure your own food. Well, we're talking about in the state of Washington, and I normally don't get into too many politics, but I'm really heated and fired up about this. You got Governor Jay Inslee, who is requiring identification for anyone who attends a restaurant or bar right now so that they can do contact tracing for coronavirus. Well, what better way to really track people and to control the people who don't want to get traced or, or all that? It keeps them from going to restaurants and supporting local businesses and getting the economy going. 
And at the same time, what's the difference of him saying, okay, if you go to a grocery store to get food, now you also have to provide your information. And it just this big snowball effect of the government's taking control of if you don't follow our rules, then you don't get to play. And I think this is where the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness comes into play, where it's like we have the right to be able to provide food for our family. And that is why hunting and fishing needs to be written into the state constitution. I couldn't agree more with you, brother. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, uh, you know, Inslee is, he's just, he's not a fan of uh, sportsmen's groups. Uh, we've, we've had a number of difficulties with him over the years. And this, this recent episode of uh, him not allowing hunting or fishing uh, it was just kind of a, uh, shined a really bright light on the, his tone deafness to the quarter million hunters in this state and the three quarters of a million fishermen in this state. It just, it, it boggles the mind why or, or how anyone could come to any rational science-based uh, uh, reasoning for that you, it's, it's perfectly fine to go to the grocery store and stand six feet apart from 400 other people, right? <laughs> but right. You, can't, you can't stand on the side of the river with a fishing rod and with no one else around. It makes no sense whatsoever. Right. So Yeah, uh, hide your spring bear tag, and here it is. The state of Washington's like, you, you can't go on public land. Uh, it's, it's dangerous. I'm like, dude, I'm... I'm going to be further away from people than I would be in my neighborhood. Right. Yep. But, but this, this is the whole problem is that if people don't talk about this, it gets swept under the rug and people are so quick to forget. Like you couldn't even, well, you, that's a bad term, the royal we, with my fingers up in quotations, we don't even know what was on the news last week. And so information comes and goes so quickly that the narrative, unless we create this squeaky wheel that is just constantly annoying for our politicians and for the general public, it is easily ignored. Easily ignored. And that is not okay. I love hunting and fishing, and hunting has absolutely transformed my life and set my soul on fire. So much so that I'm sick and tired of people not talking about this type of stuff. So... You know, you're talking about you'd love to work with somebody who wants to start a voter initiative. I'm actually going to be looking into that personally because I am so adamant about this idea of it needs to be written into our Constitution because I'm so sick and tired of our rights slowly getting stripped away like a frog in a pot of water. You know, you put it in boiling water, it's going to quickly hop out. But you turn up that heat slowly and slowly, and it's like, oh, this is comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not so bad. I can live with this. Let's go with it for a while. And before you know it, you're cooked. You lost all your rights. Well, I, I Give don't an think, inch, take a mile. Yeah, and I, I don't think you could find a, <clears throat> or, or think of a better time to, to start that process. A, we already have, uh, you know, 20-ish states that already have the constitu constitutional right to hunt and fish. You have the decision or lack thereof of uh, our governor to not allow us to hunt and fish, right? During yep. a pretty key time of the year. Um, <clears throat> and that has fired up uh, a, uh, an active base of hunters and anglers that uh, were just incredulous that, you know, something, <laughs> something so so thoughtless uh, could have possibly been done to them. So now's the time to, to strike out on that. And I, I oh, think, I totally agree. Strike while the iron's hot. Strike while people are affected by this. Yeah. You know, hunter numbers over the last several years have been declining, but in this recent spike of people's rights being trampled on, hunter numbers are actually <laughs> rising a little bit. When their people are realizing, oh, crap, I need to learn how to get my own food. And so, yeah, I totally agree with you. Just strike while the iron's hot. It's time, it's time to go. And I'm calling upon SCI right now. So, Alan, you can pass us up the chain. Like, let's go. Let's arm, arm in arm. Let's uh, get one of your lawyers who knows how to write something. And let's get this initiative rolling. 
and I'll use my powers at washing backcountry and the social engagements that I do. And let's get what 360,000 signatures for an initiative. So, yeah, you, you actually need like 245,000. I, I believe that's the, the magic number. But in order to actually get that, it's recommended that you get 360 ish because you have people that write, you know, Donald Duck on there and they fake stuff. So, right. <laughs> You always want to overshoot that number. So. What we could do with the the Democrats in California, Governor Newsom's pushing, and I could just you know mail it out to everybody and say, hey, can you sign this and fill it back and, and send it back to me? You know, because that's a trustworthy way to to get people's signatures. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, and a lot of stamps. Yes. Yeah, so and that's no, the other but of it is it's not cheap. To, and that that actually is a frustrating component for me for the initiative process in this state is that it uh, it's 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 very expensive and unless you're a billionaire then you know you can you can fund a, uh, an anti-gun initiative. So we need to, we need to find ourselves a billionaire that can fund a, a pro hunting initiative. Well, okay, so. I totally agree. And I don't think it's going to be as hard as what we think. You know, big money is out there for people to get a hold of. When I was at the Western Hunt and Conservation Expo in Salt Lake City back in February, some of these hunts like Antelope Island in Utah and all these things, they're going for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sure. They raffle off. Who has that type of money? Well, there are people out there that love hunting that would truly believe in conservation and getting it written into the state constitution that it just requires getting some face-to-face time or a written letter or a phone call. And the hardest thing to have happen is getting that first domino to fall. You get that, then everything else starts to roll. So yep. hopefully these listeners uh, hear this podcast are like, they're getting fired up and be like, all right, how can I get this going in my community? Let's grassroots this. <clears throat> yeah, well, one of the, the, w- the way to approach this, in my estimation, is you or we um, carefully craft the initiative language, right? <clears throat> yep. So that it's uh, very uh, palatable to 90% of the population. The anti-hunters are just going to, you know, they're always going to be, you know, say no to something like this. Correct. But uh, make that very palatable and acceptable on on the, the ballot in front of that, and then you know go after a, a, a GoFundMe sort of process. Got to be very careful about how you fund these types of things, um, or you could be you know end up having to talk to uh, uh, you know the attorney general who probably isn't super keen on hunters or anglers. Also, so are you talking about old Bob Ferguson? Bob, Bobby Ferguson. Yeah. Bobby Ferg. He's Inslee's best buddy. Yeah, yeah. I love when attorney generals can come up with their own laws. Right. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, let's. Uh, let's. I think it's definitely worthwhile. Let's. Let's go after. It. Yeah. Well, how hard is it to to get uh, SCI's lawyers involved to help us craft this language? Is um, that isn't that a part of what SCI does, or is it? You know, how do we get access to these these. Uh, these lawyers that they have uh it's it's well it's it's actually a fairly straightforward process uh all that we would have to do is take a look at the other state's language right mm-hmm. um, and we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, but just take a look at the other state's language that exists and then uh take take that language that we think will work in the state of washington's you know uh legislative construct and uh, have them craft it such that it, it actually does make sense and would pass muster and, and uh, stand the test of time. And then <clears throat> you, you create an initiative and the this more simple the initiative is, the, the better off it actually would be. And in case, in, particularly in this case, because, you know, if, if someone if this COVID thing lasts forever and you can't get out and do you know signatures and who wants to touch a pen that, you know, 800 people have already touched that kind of thing. Uh, you, you could just print it on an eight by 
11 piece of paper and, and uh, mail it in. Yeah. Uh, so keeping it simple uh, is, is, is key. Is, and then, and then just, you know, copying some of the stuff that's out there and, and to, to get the, the attorney, it's just a phone call for me. So. Okay. Well, there you go. Perfect. So let's, let's get this rolling and everyone who listens to this episode, let's, let's get going. Let's join hands. You know, uh, what is it? Was it Abraham Lincoln said, united we stand, divided we fall, you know? So and for the listeners, the, the most recent state that passed uh, hunting and fishing has a, an amendment to their constitution is in 2018, North Carolina passed it. And it was in 2019 that it went into effect. So it's, we're talking pretty recent. And being a former, edu- or former educator, <laughs> being a current educator, there uh, is one of the guys, Harry Wong, he wrote a book called The First Days of School. He says... Don't ever try to reinvent the wheel. Just re- reuse it and claim it as your own. So I like what you said where we don't have to like try to reinvent this stuff. Let's see what other states did to pass and, and get it going. Yeah, absolutely. So last time I was talking with you, you mentioned something about SCI has has something for educators to get the hunting more of public within the school systems where you have a grant where you send teachers off to to a camp to learn how to hunt and shoot or or what is all this that you're talking about (laughs) yeah so um there's so we have safari club international is one organization our sister organization is safari club international foundation and they primarily focus on education and conservation, as well as humanitarian efforts. Um, but the foundation has a school, in it's actually southeast of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in an unbelievably beautiful setting. There's a stream running through the property, you name it. But it's, it's a way, <clears throat> it's a place where uh, we send educators or educators could go and it's for a full week and they they learn to effectively use the outdoors as a classroom while participating in, in some fun activities uh, we we introduce them to shooting sports um, whitewater rafting trips there's uh, I mean, you name it they come away from that week having been fully immersed in the North American big game model of wildlife management, right? Um, they actually, uh, at the end of the week, can be uh, NASP, National Archery and Schools Program. Uh, they can be certified as an instructor for that, and they can take that back to their school and uh, start one of those uh, NASP programs up uh, in their school. So it's it's a, it's an awesome, awesome uh, opportunity for... Uh, educators out there that uh, and and they can earn continuing education credits for it, right? So and usually the local chapters will sponsor uh, uh, the educators. So and it's That's it's awesome. usually yeah it, it's it's uh, I I try to get down there every year. Uh, there's a work week and we also uh, have some of our big board meetings down there, but uh, every three years I think, but. It's it's usually how I approach the SCI or explaining what it is that we do with the non-hunting crowd. You know, it's like, hey, do you know a teacher? And we wade into the, the what can otherwise be kind of a complicated uh, conversation of you know why do you hunt and fish? How do you how could you possibly kill an animal? You know that kind of thing, um, but. Once you've, once you can get an educator's mind wrapped around um, the, the north north the the many benefits of the North American Big Game Model of wildlife management, then uh, the the dominoes start following, and the next thing you know, they're proponents of it, and uh, next thing you know, they're hopefully beginning to mentor some other people and younger people into uh, you know taking to the hills with uh, with the rod and hook. So that's cool. I totally agree. I am a 
I just this last year got certified as an instructor for a national archery and schools program and brought it into my school, Wait. which I am super jacked about. And it was really interesting seeing the eyes open of the other teachers in my building when they're like, you're teaching archery. How safe is that? Right. How can you get away with it? And it's like, dude, you're more likely to get injured playing basketball than you are actually shooting uh, a bow and arrow in PE class. So it's really interesting. One of the questions I had for you in regards to this is that being an educator, it's traditionally more of a female role in in history. History revolves around that, showing that. And I, you know, I worked in an elementary one year where I was the only male besides the custodian that worked in that building. So when you're getting these educators that, that are going to this camp, what's the number or the, what's the ratio between male to female? Because right now, females are the largest growing uh, populace within the hunting community. You know, that's a, that's a good question. I hadn't really ever bothered to think about the gender aspect of it, but, um, so, so I couldn't really <clears throat> answer that with any, any sort of clarity, but I put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, if I, if you went to the safari club foundation.org, uh, website and then under the programs there's the american wilderness leadership school just looking at the pictures it looks like there's a fair amount of women there but it looks about 50 50 so that's cool yeah that's cool so if you're listening to this podcast which you need to and if you're if you're not sharing it share it with other people if you know an educator get them signed up for this get them to apply for the grant to be able to go to the school because if we do not teach the next generation or the current generation, and even specifically mentorship is conservation, teaching the adults who then have the impact upon the children, then the legislation is never going to get pushed through to protect hunting, to protect fishing, and to protect our rights as, as human beings to procure our own food and enjoy life the way we we're meant to. And it starts with this. So it's huge to get the indoctrination system in which public education is, is so wild. It's so wild to, to think how, how political it is. And yet to get hunting inserted into that can just make a ripple effect that can last a lot larger and longer than one could even imagine. So I, I think that, one of, one of the, maybe in some respects, this whole COVID thing has, has opened some people's minds up to the notion that, you know, uh, meat, meat just doesn't come from the store, right? Um, right. There could be all manner of uh, situations, like a pandemic like this, that might disrupt uh, the food supply. <clears throat> what, what, happen, what would happen if we had uh, uh, a type of virus that just wasted cattle or the the chicken industry right uh, there goes most of uh, people's protein sources right, right. so it, it, to get their minds uh in tune with maybe going back to some, a simpler time of you know let's let's go take to the hills in the fall and go get our own meat and we know exactly <clears throat> exactly where that protein comes from we took it with our own hands, respectfully and cleanly, humanely, and we we processed it ourselves so that we know exactly, you know, what's in it, and mm -hmm. what's not in it, and uh, and we put it in our freezers and we use it to nourish our bodies and minds throughout the rest of the year. Right, and I love how you said that. We use it to nourish our bodies and minds because hunting isn't just about the food through that you nourish your mind through the adventure in which you go on and pursue these animals. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. And it, it nourishes your, your the relationships that you have with other people as well. You know, when I, uh, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I, I'm pretty successful. I, I usually get a, a deer and an elk and sometimes a bear every year. 
Uh, I'd love to pull a quadfecta and, and get my bear, elk, deer, and cougar. <laughs> Man, that'd be awesome. Eggs all stamped, but uh, it just uh, doesn't always happen. But man, I've got a, I've got three freezers, and I've got deer, elk, sheep, uh, a little bit of moose, salmon, and it's we just we we're just not dependent at all whatsoever on the local grocery store. So right. that, that makes me feel very good, particularly, you know, in this kind of environment where it's like, oh, um, hmm, the, the shelves are stripped bare. Right. Well, shoot. I mean, I even started thinking about when I go fishing and, and I live right by a few different lakes here. So it's really easy for me to go out and catch some trout. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start freezing them. I'm going to start vacuum sealing them, put them in my freezer. Because at the end of the day, if there is a protein shortage in America, the biggest heroes to their own small community. So like I live in a neighborhood of eight homes. Right. Is I'd be honored to be able to provide someone f with food for their family. Sure. Yeah. You know, and th that's such a, a big aspect of life is to be able to feed someone. And guess what? And so, oh, go ahead. When you do that, sorry, um, and I, sh I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, but when you do that, and you're, you're not only just nourishing your body and mind, but you're, you're also nourishing your, your neighbors, right? And you're, you're instilling in them uh, a sense that, you know what, maybe this hunting thing is okay, right? Yeah. Uh, so that when I do see something on the ballot that may be anti-hunting or pro-hunting, I'm going to vote in accordance with hunting, right? So. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have turned on, I love, I love your, uh, your website and the, the whole mentorship aspect of it. And there was, I think five years in a row where I made it my life's mission to go out and find somebody that was interested in hunting. And I took them right. That's so cool. And, uh, uh, fortunately for the most part was successful, but, and now they're just rabid diehard <laughs> hunters now they're now they're kind of pests they're like hey when are we going out again you know kind of a thing but uh but uh it's it's fun it's good but they you know and, and they in turn are are beginning to try to get their friends involved because right you know their friends come over and you know uh rich pulls out a, a beautiful backstrap you know and starts slicing into it and uh you know the wife's eyes or his neighbor rolls back in her head and she says, Oh my gosh, this is so delicious. Honey, you need to go do this. Or well, when can I go do it? You know, kind of a thing starts those conversations. It's not like, uh, something you need to, you know, hide in the closet. It's, it's, it's super beneficial for people to do. Right. And so here's one of the things like being an advocate for hunting and being an ambassador for hunting, there's no better way to do that than to love on people. And so loving on your neighbor by providing them some food or even offering some to them, uh, even if they aren't in a food shortage, they're going to definitely double think that initiative on the ballot where it's like, hey, should hunting and fishing be written in the state constitution? Well, look what it's done for my neighbor. He is such a good person. I'd hate to take that away from him or her. You know what? Let's go ahead and, and, and vote yes on this. Yeah. And that's where we always say you can't out give good when you just lead with love and you love people and, and you, you let that go before you, you know, let your light shine before men, yeah. things are going to happen. And you control the narrative, right? There's this, absolutely, there's this caricature out there of, uh, um, you know, a, a drunken road hunter that's, banging away and poaching and all of that stuff. And the, the media and the, the left love to kind of use that. And in my experience, I, I don't know any of those people, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a backpack, super remote, high country kind of a guy. And I, I will do that until I can't. But um, I, we need to control the narrative. And I, I can't think of a better way to do that than taking a, a really nice piece of meat, <clears throat> having your friends or neighbors over, and then and cooking it well for them, that's, <laughs> that's something you want to focus on is, uh, you know, making sure that that actually tastes good when they put it in their mouth, uh, not, not ruin it, but um, yeah, control the narratives, start to finish. Yep. 
I love that. I made a mistake and I gave meat to a non-hunter without telling him how to cook it. And he definitely didn't come back being like, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> so that's a, that's a very important and yet forgotten thing when it comes to introducing it to somebody who's a non-hunter. Yes, absolutely. Teach them how to cook it. Because when you taste a well-cooked piece of meat, you fall in love with it. Yeah. And prepare it properly. I, there was a, <clears throat> I got a bull, gosh, this is going back 20 some odd years. And I, my uncle had said, okay, take it to this uh, quote unquote organic butcher shop. And that's where I, he took all of his stuff. And I said, okay, fine. Took it up there. Um, and I came back in two weeks or whatever it was when they, they said it was uh, ready to pick up. <clears throat> I walk in the door and there's a banana box. Uh, or I walk in the door, give my name. Okay, good, great. She comes out with a banana box of cut and wrapped elk. And I, I, I looked at it and said, well, where, where's the rest of it? And <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, this is, this is bull elk. There's a lot more meat than this. You should have at least three of these, at least, right? And uh, possibly four. So if... And, and I didn't have her, you know, make a bunch of uh, hamburger or uh, sausage, right? So it, would, it was a very basic cut and wrap job. So it kind of got down to a little bit of a contentious discussion. And, and finally, she just sort of gave up and said, well, if you, you want to go look in the freezer yourself, follow me. And... <clears throat> And so I, I did. And as I walk into kind of like the main area where they are, uh, you know, grinding up meat and cutting and wrapping and so on and so forth, here's this gal who has her elbow propped up on the hopper for the hamburger, you know, grinder, and mm -hmm. she's smoking a cigarette. And just as I walk in, the ash from the cigarette falls from the end into the hopper where all the hamburger was made. And there's like there's cigarette smoke in this whole area. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the hell is going on here? And open the freezer. And what do you know? There, there are my other two boxes, Ernst, just right in front of the door. So um, it was at that precise moment that I uh, resolved to do everything myself start to finish. And I end up with a superior product. And you can feel comfortable knowing when you, when you take that uh, – four pound roast or maybe some hamburger that you'd ground up that it is perfect when you give it to somebody, they're not going to open it. There's not going to be a big old hairy, stinky surprise in there. Right. So, <laughs> right. Or, or, it's a, or some cigarette ash in the hamburger. So, wow. Yeah, man, you you're getting my mind running right now. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. We're definitely going to have to talk more about this and have a follow-up on how this voter initiative gets going. And by the way, anyone who wants to get involved with SCI or wants to help out in this voter initiative that Alan and I are talking about, uh, reach out to us. But Alan, how did they get a hold of either you or how do they get connected with a local chapter or SCI in general? Sure. So, uh, great question. If they go to safariclub.org, uh, that's where they can learn about uh, who we are, what we do, and sign up as a national member. You have to be a national member before you can be a chapter member. Um, and then there are a, a number of other, like I said, six chapters in the state. If you went to sci-washington.com, uh, uh, that would allow you to, to look those up. There's also a, a chapter locator on the national uh, uh, website. Um, and one other thing that you could do, even if you're, if you're not a member, is if you text the letters SCI to 73057, uh, that allows you to get involved with the uh, Hunter Advocacy Action Center. So anytime uh, an issue flares up, um, maybe in this state or, or elsewhere, that, uh, that you might be concerned about, boom, you get uh, something that flashes onto your phone. Uh, it allows you to press the link and then tell your uh, you know, state and federal and, and, and local legislators your, your thoughts on various issues. It's, uh, it's super slick. 
Yeah, the advocacy center is super important. I even took to Instagram and, and shared it with uh, a lot of people, and they actually started writing letters or having your guys' pre-written letter and signing it uh, to Inslee to open up hunting when they had it closed. So what is Perfect. that number again? So you text SCI to what is it? 73075. 73075. Right. And I'll make sure that is in the, the notes for the show so that people can can get on that, even if they're not a member of SCI, which we highly encourage you to, because as you can tell, they're first and foremost fighting for our hunting rights. Sure. Um, and I, I, I'm fine giving my, uh, my telephone number out. It's, it's 206-229-2519. Um, if I don't recognize the number, uh, don't don't feel bad if I don't pick up the phone. But uh, yeah, if, if, uh, it's, if it's important, just go ahead and leave a message and, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Yeah, I love it. I'm the same way where if I don't recognize a number, I'll let it go to voicemail. And if I don't get a voicemail, I'm like, oh, okay, well, obviously it wasn't a number that really needed to get a hold of me. They leave a message and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Here it is. I'll call him back. Yep. Uh, I love it. Hey, Alan, real quick. Yeah. Should we and do we, even if it's not written in the state constitution, have the right to fish and hunt? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know it. And everyone, you need to make sure you understand that and you start standing upon that as you go out into the general public and talk about these things as you go. So, Alan, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. You are the man, and I can't wait to talk with you more about all this as we continue um, to be advocates and ambassadors for hunting. But for all of you, make sure to go check out SCI, get involved in their hunter advocacy group, and look at that. Also, feel free to leave a review and rate this podcast. We love that. It really helps us out. And as always, stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com. And be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful.